might hear some rumbling because there's a family of foxes right underneath my feet. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I'm on in Staten Island, New York. Yeah. I just came back from the beach. How was your 4th of July? It was great. I went to the beach yesterday and today, and it was glorious. I follow you on Instagram. I love your um, your photos that you post, like you barbecuing and things. You, you, you're very good for tourism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was either that or starve, because uh, we've been quarantined no longer, but for about two and a half months we were. Are, are they lifting it in New York? Or you, yeah, you're New York. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm in New York City. You know, the, the five, you know, the five boroughs of New York City, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island. Yeah, you've That's, got that, you got that accent I love. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a story to that, you know, but uh, I'll tell you that later about the accent. Jimmy. <laughs> All right, so Mickey, I've been trying I'm going to start rich. this off. Oh, and since you're, since you're a TV well, host, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Are you Brian, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm Mickey Burns, and I'm from New York City, and I host a show here on the NYC Media Network called Profiles, and it's a celebrity interview show, and we've been doing it for 20 years, and we celebrated our 500th episode recently. and because I have so much of all of uh, you know this experience with celebrities, I just published a book, New Haven Publishing. It's called, uh, I gotta look at it, From the Projects to Profiles, a memoir by Mickey Burns. And, and that came out last, uh, at the beginning of the year. And, and now I am publishing my second book, which is a, it's another story to that, but it's a uh, coffee table book which will be out in November called Inside Celebrity Profiles. Was that a good a host, introduction, Brian? That's good. So host, producer, writer, uh, are you still Quest President Quest Media? Is that still there also? Yeah, it's still there. Uh, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, pilots for others, and we do uh, some big uh, event productions and, and television programming. That's what Quest Media does. Aren't you happy that Sherry had her book like right, right there? Yes. I've your book. <laughs> no, well, we this, this is a definite beach read. If anyone is out there is looking for something to read, um, it's for the individual that wants to know what to do to succeed in life, to get ahead. And it's also for, I think, for parents wanting to provide their children with a sense of structure because Mickey, he introduces the book in the opening. He talks about his life in the project, in the projects in South beach. And what I'm taken back by that Mickey is you, you from time to time, you go back to wanting to um, get picked for teams. And in essence, I liked how you'd get there early because you want to get picked first and, and on the winning team. And, and it's amazing how innately, that provided you with a sense of structure. It wasn't setting the alarm, you know, to get a chore done. It was setting your alarm because you wanted to succeed that day. And, and it's a wonderful um, introduction of how to succeed in life. Yeah, thank you, Sherry. You know, basically what it is, uh, when I grew up in the projects, uh, yeah, the one thing it was, it was the lower, lower economic tier. And, uh, you know, we all had to figure a way out if we wanted to better ourselves. And my, the key for me was through athletics. I realized I had my, my father's athletic gene, and that was my ticket out. But so I used to ask my mother all the time, Mom, what, how do you feel about me going to college? And she'd always say, That's, I would love that, but you're going to have to figure out a way to get a scholarship because we can't afford to send you. And, uh, and I did. I, I got a football and baseball scholarship, but it's a Missouri Valley College in the Midwest. And I love the experience and uh, actually spoke at their graduation in 2012. Uh, wow. Brian, in the, in the book, uh, Mickey talks about, uh, he, I forget what year it was, Mickey, but um, you were in a tournament, I think, and the prize was going to Yankee Stadium. I'm not <laughs> sure what year it was. And oh, they all received a signed baseball. And so Mickey, he actually used that baseball that summer. But my, Mickey, could you imagine, like, do you still have that ball? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, it was 1961, and it was 
the year that Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle were chasing Babe Ruth's uh, home run record. And, and the game was – we had the privilege of playing a three-inning game prior to their game because we had uh, been in the finals of the, 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 the vacation league uh, and we got up to play a three-inning game. After the game, the Yankee manager each gave us a ball and we stood on the, the dugout for batting practice and we got Mickey Mantle to sign and Yogi Berra, Elston Howard, Whitey Ford, Roger Maris, and all these legendary Yankees. And I remember going home that night and putting it on, putting it on my dresser. And it's, it stayed there for, you know, most of the winter. In the springtime, somebody said, anybody have a baseball? Let, you know, and, and I said, I do. And I went home and got that ball. And that was the first ball for the, uh, for the spring season for the guys and the projects. Today, if I had that ball in pristine condition, it would be worth six figures. Well, you couple with the fact that Mickey Burns owned that baseball, so that gives value to it, too. Very um, briefly, Sherry, very briefly. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I remember the very first time I went to New York, and I was, I'm was i a big Yankees fan because I followed when it was the year of Derek Jeter, of um, David yes. Justin. You know, all that. And I got all these baseballs and I thought, what can I get my father as a gift? So I bought, I went to uh, Mickey Mantle's restaurant and I got a baseball and I gave it to him and I didn't get the best reaction. So I was telling my aunt about it. She goes, oh my goodness. She goes, your great grandfather is rolling because he's a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. (laughs) (laughs) Keep in mind, at those days, memorabilia was not a big deal like it is you know, I mean, had the ball, and I said, you know, eh, you know, it's so not sitting on the, the mantle. Uh, let me put it to some use, and I did. You know, it's funny. I regret it. That, I would have probably have been the same way. That didn't mean a lot to me, but it was an honor that, I mean, the fact that you were there and you got a chance uh, to meet them, you got the ball, I think that's a great thing. And this is coming from a Red Sox fan, so I imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, on my show, I just had uh, some of the 86 guys. Uh, I had uh, Ron Darling and Keith Hernandez wow. on my show profile. Oh, wow. And we were reminiscing about the 86 uh, Mets and their m- miraculous uh, World Series win. And then right after that, I had Ron Swoboda, who was part of the 69 Miracle Mets. So it was a big thrill for me to be able to sit down with, with, with those ex-baseball greats. That's Mickey, amazing, you were, actually. Um, you're, you're... Oh, go ahead, Sherry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm I sorry. missed that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but, Mickey, I know that you're, you're just naturally, um, it, you know, a really good sportsman. Are you still an avid baseball fan, or, or what is your number one sport to watch when we can again? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, inter- it's interesting because I watch them all. I love football. I was a football player in college. Uh, ma- matter of fact, interestingly, I know Brian – Brian get a kick out of this. When I finished playing college football, you know, education was embedded in my head and I wanted to go continue and get a master's degree. Uh, And just before I started, I got a letter in the mail. The coach of my head coach in college said, I have a letter uh, for, I have a letter for you. And I never forget the letter. It said Washington Redskins logo in the left-hand corner. And I opened up the envelope and it was a letter from Vince Lombardi inviting me to the Washington Redskins camp. Uh, And that was the first year he had finished the Green Bay. Do you still have that? Uh, You know, that's I write about it in the book. I had it for years and years. And in one of my moves, it was misplaced. I probably still have it in a box somewhere. uh, But I, you know, I don't know where it is right now. But I had to make a decision. Should I go to graduate school or go to the Washington Redskins training camp? And I chose to go to graduate school, and I'll tell you why. Back in those days, you know, back in, that was 1970, and there was not a lot of money in football. Uh, people weren't making the kind of millions they're making today. Most of them were met, most of the players on the team, other than the Joe Namaths and the superstars, and, uh, were making $60,000, $70,000. That's what they were making. Most of them worked in the off season at various jobs to to get over the hump. Uh, So I wrote Vince Lombardi back a letter and I said, thank you, Mr. Lombardi so much for inviting me to the camp. But I, I, you know, 
there was one other factor. I had finished four years of high school, four years of college, and I played, I was a starter for all eight years, uh, running back too. And I, I hadn't uh, gotten any serious injuries. And I said, you know, I, I, I've been lucky so far. I can live my life pretty, pretty healthy. Uh, so I decided to go to graduate school in, uh, instead. And I wrote him a letter explaining that to him. Uh, but if there were millions of dollars involved like they are today, I probably would have went to the training camp. Money was not a factor. Oh. So I felt education was more. People played back then for the, the love of the game, not so much for the money. So, so sh as Sherry knows, we have another co-host. We have, we have, well, I actually have 12 co-hosts, all women. But Jessica, she wasn't able to make it out of Tennessee. She's got weird weather problems down there. She wanted to ask me, when you think of Smokey Robertson, what comes to your mind? Well, that, that he's a, a musical genius, first of all. The man has written over 400 songs. Uh, great personality of, and a super talent. And he was also an executive at Motown during their heyday. Uh, I asked Smokey during our interview, uh, you know, you've written over 400 songs. Who was the, your favorite <clears throat> singer who recorded one of your compositions? And he didn't hesitate. He said, Marvin Gaye. Yeah. He said, Marvin Gaye marvinized my compositions. And what he meant was Marvin took them to the next level. Uh, he, I, that's what I think about his prowess as a songwriter. He's written so many beautiful songs. So that, that would be my answer. Ricky, when did you know that you made it? Was there a certain person or a segment of a show or a, a time when you were in sports when you said, <laughs> I can't believe that I'm here. I, I think I've, I've made it finally. When did you know that answer? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question, Brian, because, uh, you know, some, some of us in show business are, are, are very insecure in that I've kind of taught myself you're only as good as your last show. And I believe that, you know, so we're constantly trying to raise the bar and get better. Uh, but I think if there was one specific time where I said, oh, I think I've, I've made it, I think it's when I'm like in the subway in New York City and somebody I'm sitting next to so taps me on the shoulder and said, by the way, I love your show. I loved your interview the other night with Susan Lucci. Or I, I, and somebody stops me on the street and says, hey, I saw that episode with Deepak Chopra the other night. Really good. Keep up the good work. That, that to me, when I, when I get the feedback from people on the street, then I feel like, you know, I've done something good. In New York City, no less. But did, Big place. Have, but did you know you were going to go into TV and being hosting? Did you have an idea? Well, I, yeah, I always wanted to do that. And there was a time where I was working at, at, at Fox News, uh, the 10 o'clock news in New York. And, you know, I wanted to be in front of the camera. I wanted to do what I'm doing today. Not too many people do what I do. There's not a lot left that do like long form interviews with people they used to be but there's not too many anymore <clears throat> so it's something i always wanted to do so when, when i was at fox after that i worked for time warner and i was doing a news magazine for them and one of the segments in the news magazine was a four minute four minute or five minute celebrity profile and we would if Smokey, let's say if uh, Tony Orlando was uh, in a play on Broadway, we'd go up there and after the play, we'd do a little interview with him, talk about the play and so forth. And I would always come back to the studio with like a half hour interview. I very seldom just got four or five minutes. They wanted to talk. Hey, I grew up in Hell's Kitchen. I did this. I did that. <clears throat> I'm raising my family in Missouri. Uh, so I kept telling them in the studio, what a waste of 25 minutes of, of a great interview for four minutes. So that's when I decided, I said, you know, let me try to do this show called Profiles. And they bought into it right away. And, and we, as, as soon as we started doing it, it became popular. Some of my first guests were Darlene Love, Melba Moore, 
And of course, Isaac Hayes. Uh, I, wow. it, it took us a while to get him, but these episodes were, were people loved them. They could, the celebrities love doing them. I love doing them. And, and people love watching them. So I knew we had a win right away. Uh, but to answer your question, I've always wanted to do this. And prior to Profiles, I hosted a show for Time Warner called Staten Island Live, which was the same as like Larry King who was live. Uh -huh. And I would interview the newsmakers of the day in New York City. And uh, th that was a great lead in to Profiles because I knew exactly where I wanted to go with Profiles. Mickey, I know that um, sometimes when we're on Brian's show, when you're having an interview that's like this, it's very fluid and it's exciting. Um, I get as excited. I remember you made mention where you're like, oh, this is going to be two parts. I get so excited when you know it's that good and there's that much wealth of information to it. But um, sometimes we're lucky we get guests like you that I always say, oh, if you're ever creating a trivial pursuit game, um, use this. <laughs> and Brian, I don't know if you know, but Mickey, before he became in front of the camera, can you tell us that story about how you you accidentally became almost like a template for the show Cops? Oh, that's yeah. Well, that's a real interesting story. It's a, it's a, it's a. I'll, I'll capsulize it. I was working at Fox News uh, as a sound man. I was just getting my foot in the door up there for the ten o'clock news, and my friend who was the cameraman got me on a special uh, called Domestic Violence. So he said, Saturday night, we're going to Plainfield, New Jersey, and we're going to wait at the police station until there's a domestic violence call, and then we'll get in the police car and go to it and film it as part of the special. And I said to myself, we'll be there all night. We'll never get a call, you know? We got to the police station, 7 o'clock. At 7.02, the phone rings, and the cops said, a woman said, husband was beating her, and he had a knife. So you're on, let's go. So we hopped in the back of the police car, headed to the house. It was an old house like the Munster's house in disrepair. <laughs> and, and you're like, you're like. And, and we ran out of the car and the cops have their guns pulled and, and the cops said, stay right behind us, stay close. And we get into the house and there's no lights on in the house. And it was February too, middle of winter. And when we got up to this, it was scary because it was so dark and, and it was old. Uh, we got up to the second floor. I noticed that the second floor window was open about a foot. And he said, you know, that's not right. It's winter. They wouldn't have it open. Uh, he must have jumped out. So we went around to the back and, and, and talked about tires, leaves, garbage, old wood. It was a mess back there. And there, and but there was hedges and things. So the cops were looking in the hedges for this guy and i'm looking back at the building and i noticed at the second floor ledge there was like a tip of a sneaker and i said to my camera guy richie i said richie put your light up there and he puts his light up and darn it it's a sneaker and as he pans to the left it, now the guy realizes we're on to him and he's looking he looks over to us and we're right on his face with the, with the camera light meanwhile the cops are still looking in the hedges so now he, he's getting ready to panic up on the ledge and the cops turn around and they spot him and they said, there he is. And they come running towards us. Now, meanwhile, we haven't moved from this spot. We're still in the same spot. And, and the man gets up off the second floor ledge and does his best Spider-Man, leaps off the second floor ledge onto the two police officers. And now they're rolling in the leaves and they're trying to handcuff them. <laughs> Well, anyway, we're, we're filming the whole, this whole thing, and I swear we haven't moved a foot. I'm still in the same spot, you know? And they're rolling around underneath us, and we're filming the whole thing. And they handcuff them, they drag them to the car, we film all that, take them to the station house, we film all that. And it was almost like it was a production. They throw them in the cell after they book them, and the cell closes, and it's like, go to commercial, you know? Unbelievable. What happened, that, that, it was that domestic violence special of which we had the best footage in the special ended up winning an Emmy award. And when it was sent out to the West, when it was sent out to West coast, because they aired it out there as well. That's when producers in Fox out there said, you know, this would make a great show. Why don't we just, you know, have our crews follow the cops all night long. And that's, that was the seedling 
for the series cops, which just ended because of what was what's going on in the country. But that one incident that we captured on tape was really the seedling uh, for the cop series. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> Once you said Munster's house, I, yeah. I see everything right then and there. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I, th I never moved from that spot, you know, which, and all this action. It was almost like a movie. It wasn't like it was real life, but it was. Vicky, when you think of, I, I, um, if you had to name 10 of your best interviews, and I, off the top of my head, I think of Robin Williams, I think of Russell Crowe, uh, George Clooney, Steven Spielberg, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey, who might some of those be for you and why? For me, for Robin Williams, for example, well, Robin turned me on to Doctors Without Borders. That's why I say that. So for who you, who would that, some of those be? Right. Why? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Maya Angelou was one of my favorite. Yeah. Joe Montana, the four-time Super Bowl champion. Deepak Chopra, I love. Robert Wagner, the actor, I, mm -hmm. I loved him. Uh, Eli Wallach, I don't, do you, do you know who I remember Eli, is Eli Wallach, Wallach? Yeah. All the Westerns, yes. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Yep. With Clint Eastwood, he was the ugly. Yep. Uh, but he was also famous. He was last Wall Street film. I had him on the show when he was like 95 years old. Wow. And yeah, and, and I loved that interview because, you know, so, something special happens in every interview, just like this one. Something special will happen that you'll remember. And sometimes it happens before the interview, sometimes during, sometimes after. After I interviewed Mr. Wallach at 95 years old, he said to me, Mickey, take a walk with me. I said, well, that'd be, that'd be fun. You know, it was a nice spring day, and I'm walking up Broadway with Eli Wallach, you know, Tony Award winner, Oscar winner. I said, oh, what a thrill. This is a good day. And as we're walking up, he was carrying like a path mark, plastic, or, uh, you know, plastic bag from the grocery store. That's what he was carrying. I said, Mr. Wallach, what's in the bag? And he said, a pair of shoes. That's where we're going. And we're going to the cobbler to get the shoes fixed. And I said, yeah, I, I thought I would be funny. And I said, with all of your money, Mr. Wallach, why don't you go to Macy's and buy 10 pair? Well, he didn't think that was funny. And he grabbed me by the wrist and he stopped me in mid stride right on Broadway, looked me straight in the eye and he said, Mickey, I got to tell you something. I grew up in the depression. He said, back then we didn't buy new, we fixed old and I've never been able to shake that. That's a life, that's a life lesson. I'll never, never forget that. So that would be one of my favorite interviews because I left with something very profound. Uh, I also interviewed Joe Montana, you know, one of the greatest football players that ever lived. And you want, uh, can I tell you a quick story about 30 second story? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he, so they said he was at a memorabilia convention in New Jersey. They said, show, show up at 430 and you're going to interview him at 545. So by, by five, 20, we were all set up with the lights, the cameras, the, everything was perfect. You know? And they put out a nice spread for us with cold cuts and potato salad, fruit. I said, Man, this is a, they're a class act. That was really nice of them. At 5.45, Joe walks in with his PR person and his manager. And, and they look around the room. First thing I see is the, the manager giving me this. Mickey, I want to see you a minute. And I said, uh-oh, what did I do? So he brings me over to the corner, looks at me straight, and said, Mickey, who ate Joe's dinner? <laughs> and I said, oh, I thought that food was for us, you know, the crew. He said, no, that was actually Joe's dinner. So I started off my interview with Joe Montana, the greatest quarterback in history of the NFL, by, by saying, Joe, I got I to gotta, I gotta apologize. You know, we thought the food was for us. I didn't mean to eat your dinner. And he laughed and he said, I would never eat that garbage. He said, I'm going out to an Italian restaurant when this is over. So I don't know if he was being honest or not, but he let us off the hook. I'll never forget that. That's funny. So the moral to that story is never assume anything. Oh, yeah. Joe, then we ate his dinner. That, that was a good thing. He was very nice. Uh, Smokey Robinson is, is right up there with my favorites because we really bonded. Uh, with that, Tony Orlando is, is one of my favorites. 
Um, are you familiar with Tony Did Orlando? He yes. Yeah, he was part of Tony Orlando Dawn. But I love him because he said to me, because I've become friends with him now, you know, over the years, you know. When I was writing my book, I, I texted him and said, would you write a blurb from my book? You know, within 10 minutes, I had my blurb, you know. He's a super guy. But the last time I interviewed him, I had him on the show more than once. He said, Mickey, I want to give you something. I love that. You know, he said, I want to give you something that nobody else ever heard of, you know. I said, Tony, that would be great. Let's go. And he said when he was doing his first show on CBS, Jackie Gleason was his first guest on his first show on CBS. And as they were rehearsing, he had two girls, backup singers. They were Tony Orlando and Dawn. And during, Jackie Gleason was sitting behind uh, Tony, and he made a racial slur, inappropriate racial slur about the two girls on the stage, his backup singers. And Tony couldn't get, he couldn't get past, and he turned to him and he said, Mr. Gleason, you owe me an apology. And of course, Jackie Gleason was the biggest, sh biggest star on television at that time. And he said, Mr. Gleason, you owe me an apology and you owe the girls an apology. You're out of order. Jackie Gleason, nobody ever talked to him like that. He was such a big star. He stormed out of the studio. And now CBS executives said, Tony, what, you just lost the biggest star on television for your first show. What are we going to do? He says, I don't know, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't let him get away with that. So Tony went to his, his, his uh, dressing room as the CBS executives were scurrying to get a replacement for Jackie Gleason. About an hour before the show, the door on his dressing room, he has a knock, opens it up. It's Jackie Gleason. Walks in, and, and, and Jackie Gleason said to Tony, is this my script? And Tony Orlando said, yes, it is, sir. Jackie Gleason handed him the script and said, open it to the first page. Tony Orlando opened it and said, I apologize, Jackie Gleason. And from that day on, they became the best of friends. In fact, every, before every show, Jackie Gleason called Tony and wished him good luck. You know, that, that's one of my favorite that, Mickey, stories. Is that Tony told me that, that story um, uh, when I did a session with him for PBS, I believe it was. But I'm sure he told you this. He also told you that his show was canceled with the highest ratings too, right? Well, yeah, but I, I, do you know why it was canceled? I, yes, I forgot why, but it was it had like a 30 something or whatever he says up there. You couldn't, these days numbers, you couldn't get those. Yeah, at the, he was having a bit of a, of, a, of a cocaine issue back then. And his behavior was a little bit uh, off the wall. And uh, that was the primary reason that it was canceled. They, did, they didn't trust him at that point, even though the ratings were great. Yeah. He regrets it. You know, it's like Eric Roberts. Um, uh, Julia Roberts' brother, and he was a great actor, been in tons of movies. Hey, do, are you familiar with Eric Roberts? Yeah, I Good call him guy. the king of the B, uh, B movies, is in almost every B movie. Well, there's a reason he's B movies, and, and he was telling me during the interview, he was heavily into cocaine during the early part of his career. He really should have been a leading man. Tremendously talented, good looking. But the reason he was in all the B movies, he said to me, Mickey, you know something? I was terrible to a lot of people. I abused a lot of people uh, because he was always high on cocaine. And, and he became belligerent when he was on it. And he said, you know, all those people that I was mean to and disrespectful to, he said, each and every one of them rised up from the ashes and got even with me. And that's why, that's why he was in the B movie because they wouldn't give him the opportunity for the, for the blockbusters or the A movies. He certainly had the talent, but there were a lot of people in Hollywood looking to get even with him. Wow. Wow. Uh, Mickey, I know that um, in times people have asked you, who's your greatest interview that you hope to get? And uh, I know that you've mentioned, um, oh, uh, he sings Pussycat, oh my goodness. Um, Tom you Jones. Know. 
Tom Jones, sorry, <laughs> my girlfriend's mother, that's her favorite. Anyways, but the other day you posted a photo of the two of you together. And so it kind of threw me for a loop. And I thought, well, maybe you've talked to him on a personal level, but not in front of the camera. Yeah, no, I met him when, uh, back in 1980 when I was working at Fox. And that's when that picture was taken. I was part of, a, a, we were his guests that night, but they were also going to do a little feature on him. Uh, yeah, I, I almost had him a couple of times. Right now, if all goes well and every and this virus behaves itself, uh, there's a good shot I might have him in November. No, you know, that right is- now, yeah. Well, matter of fact, he's doing a special concert in Manhattan in November, and it's part of the contract is that he appears on my show, oh, <laughs> so we can. Good. The the, the the concert that he's going to be performing in to raise money for a certain cause. So if all goes well, I'll, I'll have him on in November. But I've always I've always respected his longevity, his talent, and he's 80 years old and he, his voice is still as good as ever. I do love. Do you know this? Do you know this? Um, after when God bless her, uh, Jackie Collins passed away. I read all of her books, and they said that you know the rock star. Um, that she has in her book that all the girls just love. I read somewhere that that is actually Tom Jones. Do you know if that's Yeah, that? it is. He, you know, he, he, and he's quite a, he was quite a ladies man. Yeah. You know, he had a girlfriend in every port, so to speak. But he did stay married to the same woman who passed away recently. They were married like for 57 years. You know, I just had his counterpart on. But that is all true, Sherry. All true. No, They're I all just yeah, because when you're reading her books that I had to, I was checking to see who this man was because she made him elevated so much in the book. And I yeah. thought, who is the rock star? And so That's when it. I put that face to it, it was really interesting. I just had Engelbert Humperdinck on not too long ago. He was fabulous. But <laughs> he and Tom, same manager, and they all they come from uh, Britain. So can I, I, I'm going to tell you this, but this is a little bit off color, but it's not so bad. I said, in your, I, I asked Engelbert, I said, in your autobiography, you said that you made love to 3,000 women. Is that accurate? And he started laughing and he said, let me put it to you this way. Less work for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's funny. I, yeah, I, mean, I didn't say it, that's what he said. But he was quite a ladies man too. And he's married to the same woman for a hundred years. And Sherry, by the way, he lived in Jane Mansfield's house. Yep. For oh. like, like 30. He, he bought that house sight unseen, just from photos. And he kept, Did it, still have and the, he kept it the same way it was, Sherry. <laughs> it was pink. It's because oh. it had, you know, the pink uh, swimming pool yep. in, in, uh, in a heart. Uh, he, when he got there, he, he covered over it. And then oh. before, he moved, he had it redone to its original uh, specs when he sold um, it. Is it true um, that Tom Jones and Engelbert half did have a rivalry, or is that fallacy? Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, because uh, Engelbert, it cost him a lot of money to get out of the contract with Gordon Mills, who was their manager, both of them. Because, and it was just an ego thing, because Engelbert felt that Gordon was – preferential to Tom and giving Tom more attention. And he was jealous of that. And that's why he wanted to get out of the contract, which he did. But according to Engelbert, it cost him a lot of money. He didn't like that he wasn't getting equal attention. We got about two minutes. Uh, you know, it's funny. Oh. Jackie Collin was yes. my best interviews. I always interview her on each book that came out, Sherry. I never knew, because I asked her once, uh, I did it in a polite way, but she didn't say, I will never tell. And I didn't know it was yeah. Tom Jones, but I'm not surprised uh, by that, though. Yeah, I had her her sister on, Joan Collins, from Dynasty fame. Yep. And uh, enjoyed her very much, too. Still beautiful. She, I mean, yep. she was maybe in her 60, 65. If I remember, I they're both British, if I remember, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, but she was beautiful, and I loved interviewing her. I liked her very much. Like, I like LaToya Jackson very much. People say, oh, you interviewed LaToya Jackson right after she, she was on, on the uh, Amer- Apprentice. 
she was wonderful. I, I mean, she was sweet, intelligent, talented, uh, but living in the shadow of Janet and Michael mustn't be easy. No. That's the way I felt when I was in. And yeah, she very, was in very, that horrible very, very true. Yes, very true. Sherry, you get the last question. Okay. Uh, Mickey Burns, I know this is actually your question. What do you hope your legacy will be? That's a tough question because I'm always one, one, one wondering about what yours is and what Brian's is and what my <laughs> guest is. But I think after 500 episodes and 20 years of doing this show, show called Profiles, you know, I hope my legacy is that we've entertained a lot of people, that we've educated a lot of people, and in some cases, because of our efforts, uh, they become better in, in one way or another through some inspiration and motivation. That would be a wonderful legacy to have. Well, I can tell you, um, Mr. Burns, I, I genuinely, I have followed you and like uh, Brian often says, Sherry, you're taking it too seriously, but you know, after, and, I, and people will read it in the book about Christopher Plummer and I thought, no, study, study, study. You need to know the person that you're speaking to. And so I, I, have, I thank you for, I thank you for the book and for your show and you are my role model. Well, you and Brian do an excellent job. Uh, I, it's been an honor being on your show and keep up the great work and continued success to both of you. Thank you. Hey, it's Mickey, I want to thank you because you, you, you make me, you bring back memories of people that I interviewed on the West Coast. You're doing it on, on, on the East Coast, me more West, but, you know, kind of crisscross. So I think it's an honor and yeah, definitely keep up. So when Sherry comes in, now I know we have to go to New York to see you. Well, <laughs> when you come in, We'll have lunch at worst. Absolutely. All right. We'll have lunch. Sherry Nelson, on, on, Mickey, really quickly, give your social media links, please. Uh, this, I, I'm, I'm on Facebook, Mickey Burns TV. Uh, my own site, I have two sites on Facebook, on Instagram, Mickey Burns TV, and on Twitter, Mickey Burns TV. So I'm easy to find. And if anybody's interested in uh, seeing some of our episodes, they can do so by going to the NYC Media website, and it's NYC Media. It's simple, it's the only one up there. Go to it, it'll say television, scroll down the shows, go to profiles, you'll see 10 of our most recent shows in their entirety. And don't forget my book, right? From the Projects to Profiles of Memoir, Amazon.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, easy to find. All right, so with that, thank you, thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Mickey Burns. So this is Brian Sebastian, Movie Reviews and More, the Women's Broadcast TV Network, i 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and Women on TV, on TV. And if you see someone out of smile, do what Mickey's doing, give them one of yours, because the world needs it. We'll see you next week.